Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking time to tune into Drew and I's Sunday School um, this morning. Um, we're going to do it a little bit differently, and uh, I would again ask that we'd love for some of your submissions for um, questions. But today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about, um, in terms of what Brittany shared and Dr. Mellon shared on the sermon last week, um, with the text in Ruth, that um, there, there's parts of that, wherever you go, I will go, I will be there, that there's this line which is sort of taking on sentimental value beyond the text itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we can think of lots of other texts, like, you give me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. Um, do not be unequally yoked. Mm -hmm. Like these phrases that are taken out of scripture um, have just started a life of their own. Um, and we have cultural meaning, personal meaning, sentimental meaning to, to these, these texts, which really are, are, are totally removed from um, their biblical basis. So I think today we're going to spend time talking about um, hermeneutics. How can we read the text and how can we sort of explore and give ourselves ways of understanding like what, what are the lenses we come to the Bible with and, and how can we be aware of those and how can we read the Bible more effectively understanding and um, the different things we carry and we bring to the text mm. yeah no I think that's good um, I want to start just by reading that little passage few verses from Ruth chapter 1 um, you might remember from the story as it begins in the book of Ruth um, that there is a character named Naomi and she has two daughters-in-law because Naomi's two sons have died and her husband has died and so we have this picture of just three women at the beginning of the story um, who, who don't like have a place in society anymore because all the men in their lives mm -hmm. have died. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have recourse to land, they don't have recourse to resources, mm -hmm. financial resources, any of these things. Um, and so Naomi urges her daughters-in-law to go back to their families of origin um, and, and say, uh, ask your parents to be able to go back in with them and live in their household um, and, and therefore have those resources and then Naomi will sort of fend mm -hmm. for herself. And then Ruth, um, who, who is a, a Moabite, so not a Jew, um, Ruth says to Naomi in uh, chapter 1, verse 16, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And those are the verses you're referring to as kind of having taken on a, a life of their own. I, I, I've definitely heard them used in wedding ceremonies. And the most recent wedding I did, we, they, the couple requested that verse. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, to be sure, it's a beautiful set of verses, um, even pulled out of its context. But that's kind of the point, is that to use it in a wedding ceremony is a, a vastly different context than where we find it right. in the book of Ruth. Right. Um, which isn't to say that it's altogether out of place to use it in a wedding ceremony, that it can't be um, used in a different context and speak into a different context. I think that's part of scripture being living and active, is that it doesn't have to only speak to Ruth and Naomi, it can speak in different contexts. Um, but we, I think we also want to be aware of the difference in context and aware of the fact that using scripture like this passage in Ruth or the other ones that you mentioned in different contexts can sometimes warp the meaning um, or, or, or distort the meaning in ways that isn't faithful to the way, the way it was originally written. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, uh, that it's good for us to ask those sort of historical questions kind of at the outset. When we come to passages like this, um, it's important to ask, okay, what, what's going on in this passage, in this story? Um, and and we, could, we could get at that by just reading the whole of Ruth chapter 1. But I think it's also important for us to read the whole book of Ruth and try to get the context of the whole book of Ruth. Mm -hmm. um, Brittany, Dr. Melton, I'm going to say Brittany. Mm -hmm. um, Brittany talked about this a little bit in her sermon, some of the context mm -hmm. of the whole book. Um, but it takes place in the days when the judges ruled, chapter 1, verse mm -hmm. 1 um, tells us. Um, so the story is set in the time of the judges. And scholars debate whether or not that's actually what's happening or whether this is a story that's sort of been kind of 
implanted into that context for a specific reason. Um, but regardless, that's kind of the, the um, cultural situation of the people of Israel that we're reading behind this story, um, as it is taking place in the time of the judges. Um, so that's kind of where we are in the overall story of Israel. Um, but the book of Ruth also, in the Hebrew Bible, um, appears in what's called the writings. So three different um, sections of the Old Testament. Uh, the, the law, first five yeah. books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The prophets and the writings. Um, the prophets are the books that we might normally think of as prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Um, but several others fall in the prophets that we might not think of. Um, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, uh, Joshua and Judges both fall in the prophets. Um, and so Joshua is a prophet. Moses is considered a prophet, even though Moses isn't part of the, the Joshua story per se. Um, but th these characters get referred to as prophets, including Samuel um, and, and others in first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. And then the writings is kind of everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so that includes Psalms, it includes Proverbs, um, it includes Ecclesiastes, books that we have a hard time um, categorizing anyway. Uh, but it also includes the book of Ruth mm -hmm. and a couple of others that look more like narrative. They're not necessarily poetic. Um, but Ruth falls in those writings books. Um, and so it's kind of a, a story outside of the overall law and prophets story mm -hmm. of Israel. Um, and so it's important for us to kind of see it in that way um, and, and see it as a way, as a kind of like microcosm or a window into Jewish culture mm -hmm. and how the, the uh, people of Israel, the Jewish people would have interpreted the time of the judges. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a story like that. Um, which I think is, is helpful for us. And so in that context, we've got to see in the language of this beautiful passage in chapter 1, the language of covenant. Um, so we, if we go back to Genesis chapter 12, we see uh, the, the calling of Abram, who becomes Abraham, um, and God says, go to the place that I will show you, and here are the promises I'm going to give you because I've chosen you. Um, and, and that is a, a sort of promise for, for God to be on Abraham's side, to be with Abraham in a certain sense, um, and to give him a place. And we have, have all of those themes reflected in this passage. Um, so Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Um, I mean, that's the idea of presence, of being together. Um, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. That's the idea of place. Like, it doesn't matter where we're going if we're together, mm -hmm. which is the sense that God's giving to Abraham, I think, in Genesis chapter 12. Go to the place that I will tell you. It's the place I've chosen. I, God, has, have chosen. Um, and therefore, you are going to be blessed in that place, even though you don't even know where it is yet, Abraham. Mm -hmm. um, so that idea of, of place is there. Um, and then the idea of your people will be my people and your God will be my God. The covenant promise to Abraham was your uh, descendants will be more numerous than the, the grains of sand. There's generations upon generations there. The idea of a people, of a communal existence that will go under the name of Father Abraham in a certain sense. Um, so your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Um, it, it is exactly those sort of covenantal themes. Um, and so if we see the covenant background of that, um, then I think it even intensifies or shines more light on the beauty of this passage. But then if we, if we recognize that covenant context, we can use it in other contemporary contexts. So what would you say, like you, you, having that background, what are some of the contemporary contexts that we might use in our Presbyterian tradition or in our just broader church traditions in the 21st century? Mm. Well, I think a, a, a little historical way that this one was used, which I think is fascinating. So in uh, World War II and <clears throat> Bulgaria, was a fascist country. They had a king whose name was Boris II, and he was just a despot. And when, when Hitler came to power, and when Hitler uh, moved into Poland in, in 1930, September 1939, uh, Boris gets on the phone with Hitler and says, hey Hitler, come take my juice. Like, I'm on board, come and get up. And so, ra uh, rail cars pull into downtown Sofia, the, the train station there, and SS troopers get out, and they start rounding up the city's Jews. Mm. So there's not that many Jews in Bulgaria, 
um, but nonetheless the SS strip starts to um, get them together and they have this sort of like pen closure thing set up uh, in the, the train station there and the head of the the Bulgarian church is an Orthodox church and so the head of the church at that time was a guy called Bishop Metropolitan Kuro and this dude was like six foot six <laughs> and they wear the mitre hats and like the long boots yeah. So and eight and a half feet tall with the hat This guy's like eight and a half feet tall, big cross, uh, long beard, um, <clears throat> and, and he starts getting people together. And they, with this congregation, they march them to the train station and go up to the pen where a couple of hundred Jews are held. And uh, the story goes that Metropolitan uh, Kuro uh, goes up to the guards and lifts their guns and just walks into the pen where the, where the Jews are. And the guards are like, Dude, if you, you're going to go away if and you stay in there. Mm -hmm. And he lifts his hands and quotes that verse from Ruth. And, and the people were crying, they're distressed, they know what's awaiting them. And, and more and more people from the city um, start to come. And, and, and the, the city just descends on the train station. Wow. And, and then the story is that um, the train cars left empty. And Bishop Metropolitan Kuro started this mini uprising where um, only a handful of Jews were killed um, from Bulgaria. And that first sort of main exodus to take them to the camps didn't happen. Wow. And because of this um, uprising. Wow. Wow. Um, and, and where, like, where would you see the connections between the kind of historical right. events and the and that so sort it'd of be like like the solidarity events? of that um, God is with his people no matter like where they are. Mm. And I think there's like a very sort of clear an exodus picture there of these people are getting ripped from their land and getting taken to what we would now know as a as a near certain death sure but they just thought they were getting taken away mm -hmm. so that exodus parallel is clear and, and i think is it's the solidarity of love for another human and, and the his metropolitan cure's willingness to stand and in the face of he maybe death away from he didn't know but the willingness to stand in the gap. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll be the covenantal connection of um, God is on the side of the oppressed and that in being taken from place, literally in this in this case, it's um, God is the consistent and God provides land, God provides community, and God provides people and um, wherever his people are. Yeah, I think that's good. And I can also see the connection between um, the, the bishop and the Jewish people who yes. are being rounded up yes. um, are, are from two different people groups. Right, the bishop is which a is true of, the people are Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. Which is true of yeah. Ruth and Naomi yeah. um, as well. Naomi is part of the people yeah. of God yeah. as it was understood in the book of mm -hmm. Judges, or in the time of the Judges. Mm -hmm. um, and Ruth is not. Ruth is mm -hmm. a Moabite. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's Ruth, the foreigner, mm -hmm. um, or the bishop, who's mm -hmm. the foreigner, um, who, who takes mm -hmm. the the tie or, or uh, takes the stand right. to say right. these words right. yeah. and then the, the consistent lesson often especially in the old testament and the new is that the the people of god are, are portrayed as missing the point mm. and it's often the one that's the other be it the philistine the gentile the moabite mm -hmm. that is seen as sort of the reflection of godly character of goodness of goodness and of being more people of god than the actual people yeah, yeah, I think that's good. And I can see in the, the sort of covenantal connections, um, the, this kind of positive uses of this passage mm -hmm. in like a wedding ceremony. Sure. Um, we think of marriage as a covenant from mm -hmm. a Christian perspective, um, and I think that's important, and so there's an obvious covenant connection there. Um, but recognizing that this passage between Ruth and Naomi doesn't have anything to do with romance or being in love or, or anything like that. Um, this is this is Ruth uh, making a decision to align herself with someone who is not going to give her financial resources, who can't give her financial right. resources. There's the poorer of the richer and poorer mm -hmm. in, in our mm -hmm. wedding vows. Um, in sickness and in health, like Naomi is old, um, Ruth is young, but she's going to be looking after Naomi in her old age. There's the sickness and health part. I mean, so th there are some really good connections in that, but to actually take some of the romance mm. out of our marriage ceremony can be helpful if, if it's 
if, if instead we supplant it with this right. covenant. It's like if that dynamic happened today, I would, it was our, if the friend was Ruth, I'd be like, that's unhealthy. Yeah. Like, you need support to help her in her old age. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't, like, take this burden upon yourself. Yeah. Like, what about your life? Yeah. What about your dreams? What about, you know, we would be like, codependency would probably be like the phrase that would come to me. Yeah. Say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can definitely see that. Um, and I think in a certain sense, like taking the marriage metaphor a little bit further, Naomi and Ruth actually exhibit for one another something of what a marriage relationship, I think, looks like mm-hmm. in Ephesians chapter 5, mm-hmm. when Paul says, um, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then calls on wives to submit to your husbands and husbands to love your wives. It's this idea that um, wives, uh, the picture at least, is something of wives putting themselves underneath their husband. And then husbands lifting up their wives on top of themselves. So it's like this idea of the two sort of jockeying back and forth. Which in the end looks like something of an equal relationship. um, If both parties are doing it together. And I can see that in Ruth and Naomi. Mm -hmm. Um, It's Ruth saying, I'm going to come up under you, and I'm going to be subservient to you. I'm going to serve you. And then Naomi turns around and says, I'm going to find you a husband from my own family, which is where Boaz's character comes in for the rest of them. And so the two of them are um, maybe rather than codependent, they're sort of mutually reinforcing, mutually submissive, mutually encouraging to one another. Which is a beautiful picture of marriage, even though this is a, mm. a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. There's no marriage part of it right. at all in root. Right. Do, do you think we have a tendency to sort of remove from context and sentimentalize or, or just have these sort of connections to text removed from context more so in the Old Testament than the New Testament? Yeah, I think we can do that. Um, and I think, again... That's a, that's a really important thing for us to just recognize about ourselves, that, that we do it. Um, so so um, we can try to counteract that whenever we see ourselves doing it. Um, this passage is a good example of it. Um, we also see uh, passages from the law that are just sort of ripped out of context. We might think about passages that... Uh, talk about homosexuality, mm. um, and then we just pull that one out. We've got no idea what the verse before or after says. We don't even know what anything in Leviticus is. Mm. Um, but we're, we're we're very happy to pull out specific law verses um, that we think speak to our time, and then just leave the others alone. Um, I think we are more prone to do that in the Old Testament than the New Testament. Um, partly that is a practical. Uh, a practical thing that has to do with we know more about the background of the New Testament than we know about the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. There's been lots of good scholarship, obviously, on the background of the Old Testament and the New Testament. But just that it being the Old Testament being that further removed, um, that many more generations and years and cultural Mm -hmm. time and space removed from our own means that when we do have, find ourselves like not really understanding all the background right. we're happy to just like leave it by the wayside right. and say I'll use the words um, the, the actual words that I'm reading even if my interpretation of them my understanding of them is only influenced by a 21st century use of these words mm-hmm. um, and not influenced at all by any of the background um, I'm just going to pull those words out and, and use them um, and I think because in the New Testament we, um, we have more information about the background, we more readily understand kind of some of the things that mm. Jesus is doing, some of the ways the New Testament authors write, um, we don't always do that as readily in the New Testament. Mm. That's good. Do you, do you think there is, we have more of a, how, how do we connect this sort of practicing like what tips would you recommend? How can we engage with the the overarching narratives more? Because because I think we can get lost in or really focus in on sort of the micro stories of Jesus did this miracle and Paul recommended the church did X Y Z and so that, like they're very kind of like tangible things that we mm-hmm. can think about. Mm-hmm. But like these sort of like meta overarching themes that are, are woven throughout the old and into the new. But like when we kind of just our relationship to the Old Testament is sort of like signposts here, like a little bit of Abraham, a little bit of Moses, maybe one or two judges, David, Saul, 
prophets, Jesus. Yeah. Like we kind of have these sort of signposts in the wilderness, if you will. Yeah. But sort of like, what would you? How, how could you like for your Bible students? How would you? How do you get across, and how do you recommend people engage with like the the wider narrative um, and these overarching themes without just kind of like jumping back into sort of the stories and the people we know? Yeah. Um, I mean, so the way we talk about it with uh, freshman students at PBA in our exploring the Bible course. Um, is most often we give them the framework that mm. N.T. Wright uses mm. for the overall mm. narrative, what we call the meta-narrative, mm. just overarching narrative mm. um, of the Bible. And what the framework N.T. Wright mm. uses is six acts, mm. uh, acts like a play. Um, the first act is creation. Mm. Um, the second is fall. Uh, the third is Israel. The fourth is Jesus. Mm. The fifth is the church. And the sixth is um, sort of... Uh, in times, sure, um, and so uh, into right, it, th there are a couple things that are really helpful mm -hmm. about the breaking it up this way. Um, first of all, we see that even though um, the beginning of the story of the Bible, the first few chapters mm -hmm. of Genesis, um, even though they're very compact and very dense, and there's a lot going on in them, um, they are like the the, the creation account, mm -hmm. which is Genesis one and two, um, it is something that is as much an individual act of the overall story as the person of Jesus. Right. Uh, so like, it's not like they have equal importance or something like that, but it, but it helps us to see that there's a lot going on in the first two chapters of Genesis. The fall is just the third chapter of Genesis, mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. um, and that gets its own act in, mm -hmm. in Tom Wright's uh, framework. Um, and so that can help us to see that the themes of Genesis 1 and 2, the creation themes, get played out in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, we see the ideas of creation reappear in, uh, in the Psalms all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we see them reappear in uh, the Song of Songs, a book that is about romantic poetry, mm -hmm. but we get creational themes all over the place um, in that. Brittany's written on, written mm -hmm. on that some um, as well. But we also see uh, creational themes picked up in the idea of the temple that gets built under Solomon and in the temple that gets rebuilt um, after the exile. Um, and Jesus then talking about himself as a temple, all of which is drawing on garden imagery as temple mm. in Genesis 1 and 2. So we get these themes played out all the way through the Acts, which is helpful um, in that framework. A second thing that I think is really helpful in that framework is that uh, Tom Wright is, is very particular to say, we find ourselves in Act 5, mm. not in Act 6. So Act 4 is Jesus, Act 5 is the church, Act 6 is end times. Um, and, and, and Tom Wright talks about Act 6 being um, sort of characterized, and we get an illustration or a picture of it in the book of Revelation. But just because the book of Revelation was written 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that, that now we're in that Act 6 end times sure. sort of mindset. Tom Wright wants us to see ourselves in Act 5. We're still in the church. Mm part of the overall narrative. Um, and, and so I think that's helpful for us as a 21st century church, mm -hmm. not to try and think of ourselves as, well, we've got to find where we are in the book of Revelation. No, let's, let's find ourselves in this sort of um, time between Jesus and the end, Jesus and his second return, mm -hmm. um, and, and see ourselves in solidarity mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. church there. Um, and then the third thing I would say is just seeing these six acts, creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, church, and end times. As we're looking at that as one telling of a story, mm -hmm. one plan mm -hmm. of redemption on God's part, we can read a book like Ruth and say, where does this fit in in those six acts? Okay, well, it's pretty clearly in Act 3. It's in Israel. Okay, what happens in Act 3? Well, Act 3 is everything from Genesis 12, the calling of Abraham, up to the birth of the Messiah. So, so we've got the, nearly the entire Old Testament yeah. is, is yeah. in Act yeah. 3. Um, so again, we get it really dense in Genesis 1 to 3, Acts 1 and 2. And then we get a, a kind of a lot of spread out story of the people of Israel from Genesis 12 to the end of Malachi. Mm -hmm. um, and really it even includes some of that intertestamental time before the birth of Jesus. Um, so if we're trying to see what's happening in the story of Israel, of Act 3, that leads up to the birth of the Messiah, then we can see Ruth, in a certain sense, fitting into 
that narrative. If we go all the way to the end of Ruth, um, this is just a funny thing about the book of Ruth that, um, that scholars will often point out. When we get to the end of Ruth, we really get the whole point of the, of the book mm -hmm. summarized in the final few verses, which say this, this then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashan, Nashan the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. We get a genealogy mm -hmm. at the end of Ruth, um, which leads to the character of David. One, the main point of the entire story of Ruth, beyond its own beauty, and it, it's an amazing story, I love it, but the main point is Ruth and Boaz and Naomi are instrumental in securing the line of David. Mm -hmm. And David is instrumental in securing the line of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So we can see the, the, the sort of overall meta narrative even getting shrunk into the point of this random book of Ruth, which just seems like a story that happens in the time of the mm -hmm. judges. Um, when in reality, the, the, the author of Ruth is finding this story in the context of a much bigger narrative. Great. All right, guys. Well, thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you, Drew, for your insight. And please send us um, suggestions. We'd love to have some of your queries or difficult questions, and we'd love to kind of um, wrestle with those. And we hope you're well, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again um, sometime soon. Bye.